Oops, the way it goes. Y vamos a empezar y vamos a grabar. We will record for anybody who needs to watch later. Muy buenos días. ¿Cómo están ustedes? ¿Están bien? ¿Están bien? Bien. Está bien. Fan fantástico. Excelente, excelente. Uh, muy bien. Um, vamos a empezar. A little preview of what I want to do today. Uh, today we are going to work heavy, heavy, heavy duty with... Um, getting accustomed to the forms of the verb ser, one of the two verbs that means to be, um, and, uh, and why it's used and why it's used is important. You may think, well, to be. <laughs> I am, you are, he is. What more is there to say? But unfortunately, with Spanish, there's a lot more to say. So um, because there are going to be multiple verbs that might substitute where in English we would say somebody is or some people are or even I am, uh, we'll have to start to get used to some of these funny glitches kind of early on. So we're going to get used to ser, the forms of ser, why we use ser. Uh, one of the most important things will be for you to see lots and lots and lots of examples. And in your book, in the first few, uh, really the first like four or five chapters, five, six chapters, you see ser over and over and over again. But the more examples you see, the more natural it will feel. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about um, gender with nouns, why that's a thing, <laughs> and uh, and how to make nouns plural, which is super, super easy. Um, and I do want to get into some of the other verbs, because some of the things we'll go over in class will not strictly follow the order of what you see in the book, um, just because we have to get some of these basic concepts down. So, Okay, vamos a empezar. I just want to show you a picture first, and I want to start off asking, because I had asked you to check out and look at this video again, the, the old greetings video. Are there any questions you have? Because some of the things they got into were kind of long. You want to focus more on the short, uh, short word connections they have in that video for greetings, ways to say hello, ways to say goodbye. Uh, anything with greetings and farewells. Uh, are there any questions you have on anything they did in that video before we tackle the other big stuff? Si o no? Nada? Nada bien. Okay. Vale. Um, and do know also that really for this course, the most important thing will be get, getting like acquiring a lot of vocabulary, which is why you've got the book, and uh, recognizing in listening comprehension what people are saying. Um, for you to be able to say lots of things spontaneously takes a fair amount of time. So yeah, paciencia. We're going to start with a little bit of pronunciation though first, a little bit of pronunciation. We're going to tackle two things that, uh, two sounds, two sounds that will be important for you to recognize that you feel comfortable. And so we're going to take a look at these and I'll ask you to pronounce a little bit. We're only going to take a look at two letters today. We've already done our vowels, A, E, E, O, U, okay. Um, we took a look at some of these sounds that some of these letters that produce sounds you may not be accustomed to. They're different from what we think of in English. Okay. That H being silent, the J actually getting a H, an H, but kind of a throaty H. The, uh, the J sound of L, the double L, the N of the onion, the the ñ, the separate letter, true separate letter of the alphabet. Um, we're going to take a look at C and G, C and G. And we won't do every word on this list, but um, 
we'll take a few examples so that we can move on to bigger chunks of getting communication. But just so that you know, because in Spanish, in most instances, what you see spelled out is what you pronounce, okay? Uh, very, very, very few silent letters. But we are going to look at these two letters uh, together because they have each letter, la C, the C, letter C, Y la G, like hey you, but with a little more throat action. G. <laughs> uh, C and G. C gets two sounds, may have potentially two sounds in Spanish, and G may potentially have two sounds in Spanish. C y G. Uh, and what sound they make will follow similar patterns. Okay, so we're going to take a look at these. Um, letter C gets a hard sound and letter C can also have a soft sound. Okay. Letter G similarly will get a hard sound and a softer sound. How do you know which sound that's going to make? Well, the letter that comes after the C, la C, the letter comes after the G, la G, la letra G. The letter that comes after determines how, what sound that letter will make, the letter that comes after it. Okay, so we're going to take a look at uh, se, uh, the hard sounds, the hard sounds, because they follow a pattern. When these two letters, C and G, you can see my screen, right? Si, pueden ver, si. Okay, vale. Um, when the letter after se is an A and O, an U or a consonant. And usually that consonant is going to be like a CL or a CR, a GL or a GR. Usually that's the most frequent one. They're going to get a hard sound. That means the C, la C is going to sound like K, K, K. Okay. Uh, not a real brain bender. Okay. And similarly, G will get a hard sound, which will be G. G, G. Yeah, okay. Como inglés, like English, como en inglés. Uh, so these are very similar to sounds we have in English, but you just need to know because it's C followed by A, C followed by O, C followed by U, the U or a C in a consonant. It'll get that K sound. So let's take five of these and you can, uh, well, actually we'll take maybe five or six of these. And uh, you can look at the other ones later if you wish. Okay, we've got an example. Un ejemplo aquí. Canta, canta. And this gives you a, a reboot on those vowels again, because we always need to recycle the old concepts. Canta, okay. Pueden repetir. I would like you to repeat. Canta. Canta. Bien. Canta. And now we're going to have a C-U combination. Ooh, but it's a C-U-E. And that U-E is a diphthong. That means it's going to be U-E, 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 U-E. So here is a really super word to know just by itself. It means it costs. Like you ask about what something costs. That's the word you need to know. Cuesta. 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 Bien. Okay, here we've got a C O combination. Co, co, co. Corre. 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 Okay, vale. Now we're going to see a C consonant combination. You're going to hear a little trill with this R, not a super strong, rev it up one. It'll be crudo, crudo, crudo. But all k k k sounds. And next we've got a word that means clear, but people use it to say, well, of course, like to agree with you, okay? A responsive affirmation. Uh, and that word is claro, claro, claro. Okay, claro. So a C-L, a C-R, a C-O, a C-U, a C, say A, C-A, we've got our our cook sounds. One last one. Crema. 
crema. It's a way that some people may order something that people may order with their coffee. Con el café, crema, crema, crema. So k k k hard C sounds. So let's take a look at the hard G sounds. Similarly, G A G O. G U A G U O Gina consonant. Okay. Any of those combos, they're going to get the go, go, go. Well, what you feel comfortable with, right? We've got words like agua, 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 water. Okay. Muy importante. One word for glasses, and there are a few words for eyeglasses, but this is one. Depends on the country you go to, they use different words for glasses that you put wear on your face. Gafas, gafas, gafas. Okay. Uh, rubber, the substance that you might find on the sole of a shoe or in tires or stuff like that. Goma, 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 goma. Uh, here's one word for vegetable. There's more than one. This kind of looks like legume. If you ever heard the word legume in English, right? From the same Latin root as that. Legumbre. 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 Okay. And we'll take a look at two more. These are going to be G with a consonant, G with a cons consonant. This is a cognate. It means what it looks like. It is like when you are really thrilled about something, you think it's like over the moon, great. It is magnifico, magnifico, magnifico. Okay, and here we've got another G consonant combination. Grande. 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 Okay, and notice that at the end there are no silent E's, so we pronounce it grande. The word for big or large is importante. That's an important word. Grande, uh, when you're describing things or you need to tell somebody that you need something of a bigger size, the word grande is super helpful. Grande. So there are so our hard C, our hard G. We're going to look at the soft sounds for C and G because, again, they're going to follow the same kind of pattern. Okay. And that is if the letter after C uh, is an E, the letter E, or E the letter I, uh, it gets a soft sound, which means a s, an S, the exact same thing as a English S, s, an S sound, okay? In Spain, it gets a slightly different sound. It gets a TH. Actually, this is why people make the joke about Spaniards sound like they're lisping. It isn't a lisp, <laughs> uh, but uh, in Spain, it'll be a TH sound, but all of Latin America won't do that. So we're going to focus on the Latin American um, pronunciation. It'll be an S sound, C followed by E or C followed by I. Okay. So it'll sound like C, C, E, or C, C, I. Okay. We'll look at examples of that right now. We've got the word for the number zero, cero, cero, cero. If you went to Madrid, it would sound like cero, cero. So just know when you hear videos, sometimes you'll hear a th, th, th. It's pro often one of those combinations. Here's the word for center, or it also means downtown, like a downtown area. And that is the word centro. 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 Okay. Bien. Ah. Uh, Bien, bien, bien. We'll take the next example here of a CE combination. Centavo. 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 Here's another helpful word for that has an uh, s, s, s sound. It is the word for an appointment or a date. Uh, date meaning like a romantic date, but an appointment, like an appointment with your doctor, an appointment with a lawyer, an appointment at the embassy, an appointment anywhere. Cita. Cita. 
Sita. And we'll do two more because they're short and easy to show you. Uh, here's the short word for bike instead of the long word bicycle. This is the word bike. They have a shortened form like we do in English. Bike. BC. 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 Okay. And one more, which is a number word. A number word. And the number word is 100, and it's the long form. There's a short form 100 word, a long form. We'll get to that in a different lesson. Ciento. 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 Okay. Sometimes that is shortened to cien. Okay. So you may hear it without the to at the end. Um, and uh, we use that when we only mean 100, but 101, 102, 103, they use this longer form, ciento, ciento. Okay, bien, ciento. Okay, uh, la letra G, the RG letter, letter, again, if it's followed by E or I, so if it's G or G, it gets a soft sound. That means it gets that throaty H sound like you did with the J, the J letter, the same exact sound. OK, so the sounds that you had with the letter J in Spanish will be the same thing with GE and GI combination. So let's look at a few of these and oh, we've got a J and a G E, a J and a G E. The name George, Jorge, Jorge, Jorge. Okay. Here's a word that means what you think. It's just that we have to pronounce it the Spanish way, which will be we punch the last syllable a little bit more and we get the G instead of general. It is general. 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 Okay. The next one is a kind of a generic word. The word for people. Gente. 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 And I'm going to take two more words on this list. I'm going to take a long one, which means a gym that somebody goes to if they do a workout, right? And I'm splitting it into three parts to make it easier to pronounce. It looks like gymnasium, but it is pronounced gymnasio. Gymnasio. And I've got them separated just so you can separate the syllables they all actually run together gimnasio 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 okay and if you need to go to a restaurant and order a vegetarian dish or ask are there very vegetarian dishes on your menu here's the word for vegetarian vegetariano Vegetariano. And again, if we split that into syllables, because boy, <laughs> that's a long, long word. Vegetariano. 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 Bien? Okay. So two sounds for C, two sounds for G. They follow similar kinds of rules. Do know one other little thing, and this is little. Sometimes you will see a G-U-E and a G-U-I combination, okay? Uh, when you see a G-U-E and a G-U-Y combination, uh, that little U, this is going to be one of the rare circumstances where a U goes silent, OK, but the U has a job and the U's job in a G-U-E, G-U-I combination is to make the G go back to a G, G, G hard sound because G-E together would be G normally, G-I together would be G, OK, but when we stick the U in there, it goes silent, but it says 
we're going to slap that G back into g g g sound. So we get words like the word for war, guerra, guerra, guerra. Okay. We get words for like guide, guia, guia. We'll take a look at this one. Pague. Pague. Get a word like this, which means, oh, this is used for directions. If somebody says, keep going straight, they use this word. Sigue. 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 Okay. This one, I'm going to let you read and kind of work out on your own. It is rare, so we're not going to practice it. I'll just so show you what they sound like. That little double dot thing, which in German they call an umlaut. Uh, it's a dieresis. It's a, you know, uh, yeah, it's an accent mark of a certain type. Um, this only appears in a very few Spanish words, so you won't hear it a lot. But you'll hear it in words like, Pinguino, the U comes back and we do pronounce it. Pinguino, vergüenza, guero. There are so few words in the language that do this. It's not worth like a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of practice because it's rare. Okay. Yeah. What I will want you to practice for next week is I'm going to send you a video which is super, super great that talks about how to trill an R, okay? And just as a preview, there are two kinds of R's in Spanish. One is a, uh, a minor trill, let's say, okay? Uh, and that is the ere, ere. Uh, and the other is the hard trill sounds, which means you really roll that R and trill it pretty hard. And that happens if the R is the very first letter of a word, or if it appears as the double R, which used to be considered a, considered a separate letter. I'm not sure they officially mandate that now that it be considered a separate letter. But double R or R is the first letter of a word. We'll get the strong trill, the R, okay? And the way they sound different is that R by itself is R, 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 R. Kind of like we use in ladder, butter, cutter, okay? Shutter. <laughs> it's very similar to that sound. It's one flap of your tongue behind your upper teeth, okay? Uh, if you say butter, 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 butter really fast, you get a feel for how your tongue will flap behind your front teeth. Butter, 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 butter. That is kind of close to what we do with the ere, 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 okay? So I'm gonna send you a video that talks to you about how to do that. Some people find it very easy, pick it up like that. Other people find it very hard and it takes them months to get it right. So wherever you fall on that spectrum is okay. The R, the R, which is a strong trill, is tougher to pronounce. But the video is going to give you a nice intro of what happens with your mouth and what to do with your lips and teeth to make that R, R happen. Okay. So I'm going to uh, ask you to watch a video on that and check out these examples, see if you can reproduce them. And we'll come back next week and do those. Bien. Okay. Vale. Um, alguna pregunta. Any question on the CNG? If you have one, please do ask. But you'd have to take yourself off of mute to ask that. Um, I had a question not on the CNG, but I didn't understand the accent mark on like marron. What does oh. that actually? What does oh. that actually do? The okay. accent mark like that. Does okay, that what does an accent mark do? Buena pregunta. That is a good question, and I'll bring that up so you see it. Okay. Bien. Accent marks. This is actually a good time to talk a little bit about accent marks. And oops, wait, momentito. 
Okay. The word that Eric asked about is this word I've got highlighted, marron. Marron is one of like three words for brown. Why? Well, okay. It's a regional thing. Uh, you go to Mexico, people prefer the word café or color de café for brown. That's what they prefer. But other, a lot of other countries, uh, ooh, parts of Colombia, Spain, some other areas will use this word for brown, marron, marron. Why is there an accent mark on that O oh, at the end? The accent mark does not mean that you change the pronunciation of the letter O. Oh. All right. So O oh, with an accent mark sounds like O. Oh. <laughs> oh, with an accent mark sounds like oh. It doesn't change the sound of the letter. It changes the stress on the word. Okay. It shows where to stress a word. Actually, accent marks have two jobs in Spanish. One is there are some very shorty, shorty words, like two or three letter words that get an accent mark. And that means we're distinguishing one word from another uh that has and they have totally different meanings so i'm going to show you very very briefly why we need accent marks in spanish it it won't it won't be something you need to really super focus on now but i can do a quick explanation okay a ver let's take a quick look sometimes you are going to see accent marks in spanish on shorty words so i'm going to cover that first like whoop Ay, a ver. Si, which means yes. And si, no difference in the sound, which means if. Like tu, which means you, the buddy form of tu, tu, with an accent mark. Or tu, with no accent mark. It sounds exactly the same, tu, which becomes your. In little shorty words like this, uh, that get an accent mark, it just means we've got two words, C, but they have vastly different uh, definitions. They have, def they, they have very, very different meanings. So it is a, a written thing to distinguish, oh, here's the word that means yes. If I'm writing it, I mean yes. If I'm writing it with no accent mark, it means if. Okay. That's one function of accent marks, but a more common function is to show you where the stress, uh, or to show you which syllable should be stressed. Uh, and I'm not going to get into all the mechanics of it, but what you need to know is uh, when you see an accent mark, you know that last syllable gets a harder punch with your voice. So it is marron, marron, not Marron. If I didn't write an accent mark on that word, somebody would read it as marron. The way we pronounce the word breaks the rule of stress for words. So we know we have to punch the end. The accent mark just means give that syllable where you see that accent mark more punch greater stress. You know, in English, we've got a word like explanation. And you don't pronounce that explanation or explanation or explanation. You just have to know that it's explanation. Explanation. Give me an explanation. And that nay is what we punch harder. And this is kind of the equivalent in Spanish, but the accent mark is merely signaling to the reader, oh, we're breaking a normal rule of stress. That's all it does. It's showing you which uh, uh, syllable to punch a little harder. So another word you hear a lot is oh, simpatico, simpatico. And that accent mark on the a, uh, in that case, it's an a uh and not an o. Uh, that just means, oh, we just put a heavier punch on that vowel or in that syllable there, right? According to the rules, 
if I had no accent mark written on that word, it would be pronounced simpatico, simpatico, but we don't pronounce it that way. So to signal, oh, the way we pronounce it breaks the grammar rule, we write an accent mark. That's all an accent mark means, okay? So all you really need to know is when you see an accent mark, you know for sure, ooh, I hit that syllable a little bit harder than the others in the word. Bien? Good? Bien, gracias. Okay, de nada, de nada. Um, vale, bueno. Okay. And that is sufficient for now. There's more to that story, but it isn't super core information important for you to know at this point. Okay, bien. We're going to take a look at our verb ser now. Unless there's another question, uh, question. Any other question on pronunciation? See, ¿Sí? no, no. Okay, bien. Vale, bueno. Okay, let's take a look at this. We're going to hear some examples of how it is used and why it is used, and then we'll see if you can pair up the form of ser with the person, the human being it's talking about. So as kind of a review to step us through why this happens. And for the verb to be in English, we have kind of a similar situation, right? To be becomes I am, you are, he is, she is, they are, we are, you guys are. We have am, is, are, am, is, are. Well, in Spanish, they have more than am, is, are. Uh, the forms of all verbs have to go into a form for each of these six people on the grid, okay? In Spanish, we have what we call conjugations. A conjugation is just a fancy term. It means it is a verb that is changed from its infinitive, like to be, to work, to play, to drink, right? Instead of saying to do something, we change it into a form that tells us who is doing the action. So these verb forms, which are called conjugations, exist to tell who does the action. And it'll be important for you to be able to match up who does the action with the verb form that matches up with that human being, okay? Uh, for now, it's okay for you to pair up the subject pronouns, that means it tells you who's doing the action with the verb form, but very, very often in Spanish, they will drop these subject pronouns. Subject pronouns are just, Pronouns are itty bitty words, short words that stand for a person, right? Yo means it's talking about my, I myself. Tu meaning I'm addressing you in a friendly way, right? El referring to a male person. Ella referring to a female person. Usted the formal you. These three get grouped together because they always, always, always use the same kind of verb. El, ella, and usted, always and forevermore in Spanish, will use the same kind of verb, no matter what verb we switch to in the future, okay? Nosotros is the plural of yo. It means we. It means I have somebody with me. I'm not by myself. Nosotros, okay? Vosotros is only used in Spain. It's the plural of tú. You don't need to know it because Latin America doesn't use it, but it does get a separate verb form. Uh, just so you know. And then the plural of el, ellos. The plural of ella, ellas. The plural of usted, ustedes. Okay. Uh, and again, like el, ella, usted, use the same kind of verb. Ellos, ellas, ustedes, forevermore. They always use the same kind of verb. All right. So these comprise what we call first person, yo, singular. First person, nosotros, plural. Second person, tú. And, well, this one only in Spain, vosotros. Third person, but singular. It's talking about one human being, not me, 
and well, it could be you if it's a stay, but a single human being, right? Third person singular and third person plural. Uh, uh, I am not in this group, but it's a bunch of people or a bunch of things. Okay. And we need to know that these are the forms of ser that will match up with these pronouns. And the funky, very odd thing is that whenever you see a subject pronoun in parentheses, it means people are typically going to drop saying that word. They will just not bother with it because this verb all by itself can only mean I'm talking about me, number one. Okay, Joe. All right. So because that says the whole idea together rolled into one word, people will drop the word yo quite often and they'll just say soy. People will drop the word tu quite often and they will just say the word eres to say you are. People will drop the word nosotros quite frequently and just say somos. It's okay if you pair them up. It's not wrong. It just sounds kind of emphatic, kind of overemphasizing if you use it. Okay. Uh, for third person, because it could be any one human being, it is more common to have a name or a noun of some sort or the pronouns that you see in the box in the grid used with S and the same with son. Okay, so here are our forms and all verbs will get this many forms in Spanish, but this is just ser. So it is soy, eres, es, somos, we are, son, they are. Okay, bien. So a review. So what I want you to notice is that we're going to watch a video that's going to show um, how we use ser, uh, why we use ser, situations in which we use ser, because there's more than one verb to be, sadly for us, because we're not used to that concept at all in English. We have only to be. Spanish has more than one. But I want you to notice when we use to be, the idea of to be, to give a physical description of somebody, when we talk about their occupation, when we talk about personality traits that people generally have, how they usually are, how that person usually is. When we tell time, like from your watch, or when we tell dates off the calendar, when we tell where somebody is from, and you saw lots of nationality examples in your book, and when we talk about relationships, meaning, yeah, who somebody is, what role they play in the family, okay? Um, these are the reasons or the situations in which we use this verb ser, they are the typical situations of using ser. So we're going to take a look at this video, which uh, it's going to be heavier on the yo form and the nosotros form and lighter on the other forms. But I want you to notice the kind of combinations um, that we will hear. And these are really typical context uses for ser. So let's watch it. Practiquemos. And if you want to use this later, you're going to get a link for this in the email. You can play it again and practice saying the words after you hear the examples here. Okay. Usos de ser. Uses of ser. Why we use it. What context do we use it in? What situations do we use it in? Soy Carmen. Oh, just to give an ID. I'm naming myself. I'm Carmen. 
this is one situation. Ser is an identification verb. Soy Roberto. Soy estudiante. Soy estudiante. Yeah, again, it identifies who that person is, what they do during their day. We don't really think of student as a job, but, eh, you know, it's what you are doing long term if you are a student. Soy estudiante. Somos estudiantes. Ah, now you see what happens with the plural. This is a little preview to a plural. Estudiante gets an S tagged on the end to make it plural, <gasps> like English. So it's not a hard concept to pick up. So do notice that, okay? We are students. Somos estudiantes. It means I'm talking about myself and I'm putting somebody, one person, two people, five people, 15 people, however many into the group with me, somos, somos. And notice, it is not typical to say nosotros somos estudiantes. It is okay, but people will drop the word nosotros. Somos estudiantes. The only idea that somos can match up with is nosotros. So they say, why bother? Say nosotros, just somos estudiantes. Soy médico. I'm a doctor. Profession. Uh, and notice that accent mark means we don't say that word medico. It's medico. <laughs> All the accent mark means is I punch the E from me harder than the other syllables. Medico. That's it. Soy médico. Soy médica. Ah, and now we see... Our first indication of this ah ending on a noun says it's feminine. So a lady doctor will be medica or doctora. Either word is allowed. But the ah at the end tells you it is a female. Somos. Medicos. Ah, here's a plural. Somos medicos. We are doctors. And notice if you're talking about a group and if there's even one male in the group, it goes to the masculine form. And if we've got a word medical doctor, the only way we, thing we need to do to make it doctors is to add an S like we do in English. Medicos. Medicos. Okay. Soy Frances. Ah, I'm French. And nationality, where you're from. Nationality uses ser. Soy Francesa. But I needed to make it a, a female French description, okay? Because we're talking about the lady now. Soy Francesa. Soy Francesa. Somos franceses. We are French, and that gets a special ES ending for plural. That's um, not a super typical one, but one of the ways we make plurals in a few situations. Soy cocinero. Somebody who cooks for a living. Soy cocinero. Or somebody who just is a good cook, right? Cocinero. Uh, soy cocinero. I am a cook. And oh, notice you've got a co and a si. <laughs> you've got two of our C sounds. Cocinero. 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 I don't need an accent mark because we're punching the second to last syllable, which is what we're supposed to do. Cocinero. Cocinero. I don't need to write an accent mark there. That stresses the syllable it's supposed to. Cocinero. Soy italiano. Nationality, italiano, male. Yo también soy cocinero. And the word también just means to, T-O-O. -O. Also, yo también soy cocinero. Soy chino. Nationality, 
chino. Soy camarero. Camarero is one word for waiter. Soy español. Nationality, español. Soy delgado. Ah, now we have a description. Thin guy. Slim. Delgado. Delgado. Okay. Descriptions of physical appearance when it's not easy to change thin or fat. I mean, it takes a long time to change that. Uh, we use ser with those kinds of descriptions. That's the way that person is. It's a physical trait that is not easily changed quickly. So we use ser to say somebody is thin. Soy gordo. Well, we got a sumo guy there. That. Soy japonés. We've got a, um, a nationality, origin. Soy morena. Brunette, morena. And now that description word, morena, gets an a, ah, a feminine ending, right? Dis uh, uh, both nouns and Adjectives, that means describing words, that end in a uh, are telling you feminine, okay? Uh, when we talk about people who are women or objects, all nouns in Spanish are masculine or feminine. So uh, any descriptions that talk about that person or that thing have to go into the same form, meaning a feminine form. A little bit more on that later. We're going to focus more on the soy part. Uh, again, this is a physical description, not easily changed. Soy mexicana. Nationality, it gets a feminine form. We're talking about a girl, mexicana. Soy rubia. Rubia, blonde. Soy alemana. Alemana tells you female, a German lady. Nosotras también somos alemanas. Ah, we too, we also are German gals. <laughs> we are German, okay? And you notice that nosotros does have a feminine form, nosotras, but we... You won't hear it often. You hear it sometimes. You hear it only if the we group is 100% all women. If it's a mixed group, it goes back to nosotros. If I had 99 women and one guy, it becomes nosotros, the masculine form. That's the way they do it. But all gal group. Oh, we are Germans. Somos alemanas. Somos alemanas. And we've got a plural German description and a feminine German description. Bien. Somos rubios. We are blonde. Two guys, so a plural. Somos Americanos. Americanos origin, but plural form. Somos estadounidenses. And here is the acceptable word for U.S. citizen. I know we say American, but really how you should introduce yourself is estadounidense, which is a heck of a mouthful. Estado for states. Univense for united. And we make that plural by just tagging an S on the end. So we are Americans becomes somos Estado Unidenses. And the way to approach that word is to break it into two words, Estado and Unidenses. Estado Unidenses. I know it's a mouthful, but there you go. Nationality, we use ser. Yo también soy estadounidense. And there we've got a singular, estadounidense. Soy. Soy famoso. Ah. Description of what that person soy is like. Barack Obama. Identification. When we have that somebody's name, it's soy ser. alto. Physical trait, ser. 
soy muy alto. <laughs> We just intensify alto with muy, very. Soy bajo. I'm short, not easily changed. Soy muy bajo. We just intensify bajo with muy. Soy bonita. Ah, and notice, here's a physical description, pretty. We're talking about a woman, so it becomes not bonito with an o on the end, but bonita with an a on the end. Soy muy bonita. Ah, intensify. Muy bonita. Soy muy bonita. Soy modelo. Modelo is one of the very few words. This is an exception to a rule, so don't get... Uh, too worked up about it. You would think it should be modela. It's talking about a woman, but this particular word, just because <laughs> there's no reason, is always modelo. Okay, so most words don't do don't look like that or sound like that in Spanish, but that particular one does. A model, a person who does that for a living, is modelo, whether it's a man or a woman. Most of the time, that will change in Spanish to an a ah on the end, but. There's no reason for it. That's just the way this one is. Y soy actriz. Soy actriz. What I do for a living. Occupation. Ser. Soy Megan Fox. Identifying who I am. Soy Megan Fox. Recuerda. Ser se usa para expresar. Ser is used to express. Identidad. Identity, who somebody is. Soy Roberto. Like this. Soy Megan Fox. Like this. Nacionalidad. Nationality or origin, where somebody is from. Soy italiano. Somos alemanas. Ocupación. Occupation, a job. Soy cocinero. Soy médica. Descripción. Description, whether it's physical or personality, either way. Soy bajo. Soy gordo. Soy singular. Somos. Plural. Okay. And this was heavy on soy and somos because those are not like what you are used to in English, for sure, for sure. So we're going to amplify. Uh, we're going to riff on that. We're going to show you lots more examples. But first, we're going to see if you can match up the right form of ser to talk about the right person. And after that, we're going to see some examples of how we use ser. Okay, bien. And uh, you'll probably want to take yourself off of mute so you can shout out your answer. Yay. Uh, we've got all these forms mixed up on the right. A la derecha, a la derecha, on the right side of the screen. We've got somos and son and son again and es and soy and es again and eres. Let's see if we can move these around. And which one of these verb forms will we use to talk about? Mi hijo, my son, my kid. If I want to say my kid is, which form matches up with mi hijo, my son? Uh, es. 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 Happily, happily, es is quite similar to that word is. <laughs> yeah, es, es. Okay. Uh, I could say mi hijo es alto, mi hijo es joven, my son is young. Mi, yeah, yeah, okay. Bien, yo. Which one, yes. which one of these do I match up with? Yo. Soy. 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 And you will normally hear people using just, yo soy, uh, or just soy without the yo, but, you know, for your purposes, if you need to match them up now together, that's okay. Mi hijo y yo. That means the same thing. It's in the same spirit as nosotros. Mi hijo y yo. 
my kid and I, meaning I have somebody with me. Which form? Somos. Somos. Excelente. Somos. Somos. Fantástico. Ustedes. You guys. Eres. Es. Ooh, we've got two answers. Wow, wow. Which one? Cuál? And remember, it's yes. you guys. Eres. Eres is for one you, oh. a buddy you. Okay? Yes. No, that's okay. So we know it's not this one. Process of elimination. It's going to be one of these. Son. 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 Son is a plural verb. It's the plural you are. Ustedes, you guys. Okay. So I could say, por ejemplo, ustedes, you guys. I'm talking to all of you on the screen. Ustedes son estudiantes. Ustedes son inteligentes. Uh, ustedes son muy atentos. You're very attentive. Ustedes son activos. You are active. Okay. Uh, ustedes son. You guys are. How about if I talk about one gal, Alicia? Um, eres. Yes. Es. Yes. If yes. I'm talking okay. about her, es. 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 If I were talking to Alicia directly, hola, Alicia, yeah, then it would be eres, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about her. So it's es, es. She's one person, so it's es, okay? Uh, Ricardo y Laura, I'm talking about two people. Son. 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 The only idea I can pair up with Tú is for this verb, eres, okay? Tú eres, tú eres, tú eres, okay? Bien. Um, I will send you an additional little worksheet to practice that some more because it does take a while. If you didn't get all these right, don't feel bad. It takes a lot of practice. These are not what we uh, exactly use in English. So it takes some practice. So I'm going to send you a separate worksheet to practice that skill a little bit more with different prompts. Okay. Yeah. Um, and next we're going to see some examples uh, of how I might use these ideas with said. And we're going to emphasize less the soy and less the somos. And we're going to emphasize more the S and the son. Okay. Example. So we're going to see why we use, uh, why we use ser. And remember, we use ser to talk about, as you will see here, we use ser to talk about the essence or the core to identify. Uh, we're going to talk about this verb estar in a little bit, not just yet, but soon. Estar is used also to mean to be, but it talks about how you feel or where you're located. And we'll see the silly rhyme in a little bit, but not quite yet. We're going to look just at the ser examples. We're going to take those out. If I talked about these two people, I'm talking about more than one person. So I've got to use son to say they are. So, ah, son, Jorge Clooney, George Clooney, y su esposa Amal. They are George Clooney and his wife. Amal es bella. Now I'm just talking about her. Amal es bella. Es bella y morena. She is beautiful and brunette. Descriptions. Es inteligente. What she's like. Smart. Porque, because, just porque means because. Porque es abogada. She's a lawyer. What she does for a living. And notice, because she is a lady who is a lawyer, it is abogada. 
for a man that would become abogado. Abogado. Okay. Jorge es actor. I'm just talking about him. Jorge es actor. What he does for a living. Es muy famoso. He's famous. That describes him. And yeah, not what he looks like, but just that he's famous. Okay. Let's look at some nationality descriptions. And again, these are going to emphasize not the soy and the somos, but talking about one person. Es norteamericano. That's one way to say American. Es un hombre norteamericano. He's a U.S. He's a man who's a U.S. citizen. Another way to say American is es estadounidense. Nationality. Es estadounidense. Es canoso. He's gray-haired. Es atractivo. He's attractive. Oh, different verb, not ser. Tiene una barba. He has a beard. beard. <laughs> Tiene una barba. And oddly enough, beard, even though a man's a man has it on his face, the word beard by itself is a feminine noun. The word beard. Beard is a thing. That means it's a noun, and it happens to be a feminine noun. I know, even though it's on a man. Tiene una barba. It's a feminine word. Okay. I have a question. Si. Um, for the, she is intelligent. If you don't have the por qué, like you can't see the lawyer is feminine, would you know if this was male or female? Es intelligente. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh so like. How do you know this is talking about a woman? Is that yeah. your question? Yeah. Um, some adjectives end in o or a, and they tell you masculine or feminine. Adjectives that don't end in o or don't end in a, if they end in an e, they're used for both women and men the same way. So I could say, ella es inteligente, she's intelligent. I could say, Él es inteligente. He is intelligent. Inteligente never changes in form. Adjectives that end in a letter E, a letter E, don't change in form. All right. Bello, beautiful, has to become bella. Feminine form of beautiful. Uh, moreno, brunette, has to become morena, a feminine form. But these, that word stays the same whether it's talking about a man or a woman, okay? And I'll give you some things to help you with that um, for the week. Bien, are we good with that? See? Sí? Okay, let's see some other descriptions with nationalities and descriptions. Ah, okay. Es, I'm gonna tell who he is. Es el líder leader, es el líder político del Canadá. I'm identifying him by using ser. Es el líder político del Canadá. He is the political leader of Canada. Ah, or I'm going to change it to his name is. Se llama Justin Trudeau. Se llama, his name is. I could say es Justin Trudeau. It would carry the same idea who he is. Ah, here comes nationality. Es canadiense. Es canadiense. And that ending, canadiense, like estadounidense, stays the same for masculine feminine. Now I'm going to describe him. Es joven y guapo. He's young and good looking. Handsome. Guapo, handsome. Es joven y guapo. Okay, and I'm going to say he has black hair. Tiene el pelo negro. Tiene el pelo negro. He has black hair. Okay, uh, just to give you an idea, the other verb that is not 
ser, but also means to be, is estar. And here's how it would sound to talk about where he is right now. Está en Ottawa. He's in Ottawa. We use it for location. Está en la capital del Canadá. He's in the capital of Canada. We use estar for location, just so you know. Okay? Bien? Vale. Okay. Let's talk about a woman. And we're going to mix up some of our verbs. Oh, here's our first verb we have, which is not ser, but se llama, her name is. Se llama Sofia Vergara. Her name is. I could easily take out the se llama and just plug in es, and that would be okay. An equivalent. Es Sofia Vergara. She is Sofia Vergara. Carries the same idea as plugging in a different verb. Se llama Sofia Vergara. Her name is. Okay. There are two different verbs, se llama and es. But in this case, they would carry the same idea with them. We're identifying who she is with her name. Okay. Es colombiana. She's Colombian. And notice that adjectives that are feminine that end in a, right? They're telling you we're talking about a lady here. For a man, it would be es colombiano, es colombiano, but for a woman, it's es colombiana. Uh, if I describe her, if I describe what she looks like and what her personality is like, I might use ser with a description like this. Es delgada, she's thin. Y muy cómica, or y muy graciosa. Those two words, cómica, graciosa, both mean funny. Not funny looking, just funny, <laughs> humorous, okay? Es cómica, es graciosa, es delgada. We use ser to describe what she is really like. Es actriz. There's what she does for a living. Es actriz en un programa de la televisión. She's an actress in or on a TV show, program. Bien? And I'm going to give you a little preview. We use the other verb for to be to talk about location. Está en Los Ángeles para trabajar en su programa de la tele. She's in L.A. to work on her, whoops, her TV show. So to talk about location carries a different idea in Spanish than talking about where you're from. Where you were born cannot change. It is a constant. So we use ser. But where you're located can be different now, two months from now. Yeah. Location. <laughs> Location will use estar. And you'll see forms of estar very, very, very soon. Okay? Bien? Okay? Está bien? Uh, alguna pregunta, any kind of question on those descriptions that you saw? No? Okay. Bien. Let's, let's preview something a little bit different. And here's where we're going to depart from the book a little bit. But it's kind of time to sadly show you that Spanish has a lot of verbs that they plug in in different situations. Whereas in English, we may only use one word to say that idea. But in Spanish, they're going to use a variety of words, or I should say a variety of verbs to convey different contexts. So we're going to introduce this now. This is going a little out of order for what you have in your book, but here are 
four super important verbs that will be important for you to get comfortable with soon. Okay. Um, and the four verbs are I, and remember we don't pronounce the H, I, which means there is or there are, ser, which means to be, estar, which also means to be, but in a different set of circumstances, and tener, which means to have or sometimes where we use to be, okay? Um, we're going to kind of take this one in a different lesson, um, but just know that in some circumstances where we say somebody, and I'll give you the exact translation, uh, somebody is hungry or is thirsty uh, uh, or is afraid. Sometimes, even though we use is in English, they're going to use that verb on the end, tener, all right? And we're going to take that more in detail on another day, but we're going to look at these three together right now. I means specifically, whoops, there is or there are, okay? It's that specific meaning when we inject the idea of there is, or there are. I only gets that one form. You had in, for the verb ser, soy, eres, es, somos, son, but for I, it's only I. No matter what you're talking about, it's always I. So it doesn't change, yay, okay? Uh, ser is used, to say many forms of to be, and estar it will go into many forms to say to be. So we're going to look at what uh, those look like and why we use those. What are the context? What's, what's the context mean? How do I know what I do? Oh, perdón. Hang on. Okay, here we go. I is the grand prize easy verb. Unlike the other verbs on with, with ser or estar, I has only one form and it's always I, okay? I refers to there is or there are. It says something is just out there. It only talks about something existing. So, the, the job of I is just to tell us that something is around. It's out there. And it is a super useful verb because sometimes we want to use it to ask if a certain kind of store is around. I'll give you an example. Uh, and, and actually, you're going to see an example this week. You're going to see how they use it to talk about food in a fridge. We can use I to talk about one thing. We can use it I to talk about a bunch of things. Singular or plural does not matter. I'll give you an example. I una pluma, there is a pen. I muchos papeles, there are many papers. I use I if I talk about a bunch of things or if I talk about only one. Sometimes you may want to ask if there is, there is a pharmacy around because you desperately need to get something like Tylenol. And you would ask, hay una farmacia? Is there a pharmacy? Hay una farmacia? You just want to know, is it around? Is it out there? That's why we need the verb I. Okay. So that is the context in which we use I. I'm going to show you next the forms for estar. Estar, like ser, means to be, but we use it in different situations. And here's the funny rhyme 
that will help you to figure out, do I need to use a form of ser or a form of estar in a sentence for how you feel or where you are? Always use the verb estar. It rhymes. For how you feel or where you are, always use the verb estar. Okay, so whereas we use ser to talk about things that are not easily changed, like your physical appearance or your personality, what somebody is like, or to talk about where they're from, that's never going to change, uh, to talk about what they do for a living, a difficult to change situation, we use ser, but estar is used to talk about location, where something or somebody is located. We use estar for that purpose. We use it to talk about health. Estoy bien. I am well. Estoy enfermo. I am sick. We use it to talk about how we feel. So happy. We talk about oh, emotions, how you feel. Happy, sad, worried. Busy, <laughs> temporary states, uh, uh, emotional things, things that are easily changed. Okay. Uh, a state that can easily change uses estar. It uses estar. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to show you the forms of estar. Your book doesn't show you that yet. I will get you the chapter and page number where you can see that in your book. But here are the forms of estar. And again, they'll have to match up with the subject pronouns of yo or tú or el e a usted, those grouped together, or nosotros or uh, in Spain only, uh, vosotros, or ellos e a sus teres. And here are the forms of estar. Estoy, I am. Estás, you are, to talk to tú, the familiar buddy, tú. Está, to say he is, or she is, or you are, está. Estamos, we are, I have somebody with me. It's not just yo by myself. It's mi hijo y yo, my son and I, or mi esposo y yo, my husband and I. We have to add somebody to yo to get to use this word estamos, okay? And then están for ellos or ellas or ustedes, okay? And what I want you to notice is that these verb forms follow kind of a pattern, even though ser and estar are both what we call irregular verbs, meaning they don't follow a strict pattern that's predictable and they have to be memorized. They still kind of follow a form. I want you to notice that a plain old S on the end means it's a tu verb. A mos on the end, it means it's a we verb. A n, n, n sound <laughs> added to the end is a they form. Okay? And that happened here too. And n, n on the end is a they form. A mos on the end is a we form. And s on the end is going to be a tu form, okay? Uh, this yo one is kind of irregular for both, but um, there we go. There are the examples of estar, estar, okay? Um, these are things we have to rewire our English thinking brain for, all right? Uh, Okay, um, there is a video that talks about ser and estar, and it's kind of longish. And I will 
send that out to you to watch. Um, it is kind of geared for middle schoolers or uh, young high schoolers, but it's actually kind of useful. And it's going to talk about all three of these verbs. So it'll kind of preview this idea of tener uh, used in what we call idioms, uh, special expressions. But you'll see how the context is used for ser, to identify a person, tell what they're really like or usually like, using estar to talk about location or how they feel, right? Health, emotions, location, those will use estar. And you'll hear the different situations of how we use estar in all of those. Okay, bien. Um, that's kind of a lot to grapple with for a while, but it's kind of the, the sad fact of what we need to uh, think about. We're, we're going to take a, a quick look at another video. Uy, donde esta? Uh, something that just talks about plurals, okay? Plural nouns, plural things. And this is going to be the easy part of our lesson, the easy part of our lesson for today. And I'll give you the link to this video so you can watch it again at your leisure to kind of let it sink in. But this is a rule that you saw in that sad video where they showed you a cook or a guy from France or a guy from Italy. Okay. And this talks about when we have, um, when we have nouns, not the verbs, but nouns, people, places, and things, how we make them plural in Spanish. And this is going to be kind of, it's going to have similarities to English, okay? So we're going to watch this together because she's got lots of good examples. Today in lesson number three, we'll talk about how to form plurals in Spanish. But wait, what is a plural? It, it means more than one. one. We will start with a very <laughs> quick explanation and then we'll move on to some practice. Let's get started. Let's skip through that. Masculine okay. L and feminine oh, la oh, hang on. Remember, okay. we use masculine L and feminine la to say the. the okay. And L and la do mean the. L is telling you the noun is masculine. La is telling you the noun is feminine. And all nouns, whether they are people or things in Spanish, are either masculine or feminine. They just are. We don't have that in English, but they do. All right. So pen, la pluma, la pluma, the pen. It's got to be la pluma or una pluma, a pen. Okay, uh, so she's going to kind of combine this idea of both gender, masculine and feminine, and plural, singular, or plural. Okay, so she's combining these ideas when we talk about nouns. They have gender, masculine or feminine. They have number, singular or plural. These words also have plurals. If the word is masculine, el will become los. And if the word is feminine, La will become las. The same thing applies to un and una. Un becomes unos and una becomes unas. And those are words that we just call articles. You might say the pen, meaning you want a specific one, or a pen. Get me any old one. All right. La pluma, the pen, but una pluma, a pen. I don't care which one you get. Una is just indefinite. It means any old one of that item we call a pen. All right. But the important thing to know is that pluma is feminine. So anything that talks about pluma goes into a feminine form. And it'll be a singular feminine form or it'll be a plural feminine form, depending on how many items you're talking about. And so we're looking at gender and number. This is very important. If the article is plural, the word will be plural. And if the word is plural, the article will be plural. Like the word el perro will become los perros. Now let's learn the three most important things you need to know when learning how to form plurals in Spanish. Number one, 
To most words in Spanish, you will add an S to make it plural, like in la llave, las llaves, la casa, las casas. So notice, nouns, people, places, things. Nouns that end in a vowel, we just tag on an S. Wow, that's not too different from English. El niño, los niños. Number two. If the word finishes in a consonant, add ES. Ah, so if the last letter of the noun, if the last letter of the person, the last letter of the place, the last letter of the thing, the noun, is not a vowel, not A-E-I-O-U, but it's a consonant like ere, like this, then we have to add an ES. And again, we kind of have some words in English that do a similar thing. Church, churches, uh, we have kind of some similar things. So you can relate to that. La mujer is one woman, right? The woman, a specific woman, la mujer. Like in la mujer, las mujeres. And there's a plural, mujeres. Mujeres. We just add an ES. I can't add an S onto a consonant. It has to be ES. It's just what they do. And we'll practice some more with that next week together so you get the hang of it. Mujeres. El corazón. Los corazones. And we make corazón, heart. It's a thing. Corazón ends in an N, so I have to add on an ES. El comedor. Los Comedores. Number three, does the word end in Z? Change that Z for C-E-S. This is just a spelling thing, guys. It does not sound any different because we change the Z into the letter C. It's a spelling rule that we have that they have, like we in English have spelling rules. And it only happens in certain words, not like a ton. So uh, this is something to keep in your back hip pocket. Nouns that end in a Z, if I make them plural, the Z changes into a C first, and then I add the ES. Like el pez, los peces, el lapis, los lapices. Hmm. Now let's see if you and Cody got it. I'm going to show you some words, and you and Cody will give me the plural form. Are you ready? Let's get started. Los perros. Los perros. Las narices. Las narices. That's a Z to see. Oh, we've got a Z that's going to change to a C. Uh, las nueces. Las luces. Remember, this one is las luces. Los hombres. Los hombres. Las acetes. So el is masculino. El ah. aceite. Los acetes. Remember, this one is los aceites. Los papeles. Los papeles. Las nubes. Las nubes. Los espejos. Los espejos. Comedor. Los comedores. Los comedores. <laughs> this one is los comedores. Uh, los árboles. Is that right? Los árboles. So how did you do? Did you get them all right? Let us know in the comments below. Let's review what we learned today. Today we learned that if you want to make a word in Spanish plural, most of the time you will just have to add an S. Like in perro, perros. If the word finishes in a consonant, you will just add ES. Like in mujer, mujeres. And finally, if the word ends in Z, simply replace the Z for C-E-S, like in pes, peces. Don't forget to change the article to plural as well, like in 
El espejo, los espejos. Or like in la nube, las nubes. That's it for today's lesson. Okay. Y eso es todo. That's it for that. I will send you the link to that so you can watch it again. I would encourage you to watch uh, all those videos una vez más, one more time. Bien. Um, okay. Vale. Because it is a lot, but it all starts to weave together. These ideas kind of start to hang together like spit. <laughs> okay. And if you make mistakes along the way, that's okay. We'll clean that up as, as we go along. But nouns, people, places, things, okay, they have both gender, masculine or feminine, and number, onesie or twosie, okay, basically. Um, so every word that talks about a noun has to match the gender and the number of that noun. So that means even words for the, la pluma, the pen, or una pluma, a pen, becomes las, oh, let's put it against the red, las plumas, the pens, or unas plumas, some pens, okay? Uh, even if I extend it and I want to say the black pens, this is stuff you started to see in those ser videos where they have the little magnifying glass zooming in. Okay. If I want to say the black pens, hey, I want the black pens. Las plumas negras. Even the word black will go into a feminine plural form because it's talking about more than one pen, a feminine thing. So the gender of the thing you're talking about, it will become important. You'll start to see descriptive words going into masculine forms or feminine forms. And we'll talk more about that next week. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Bien. Bien. And I'll send you all the links for all that stuff. I do want you to practice. Uh, I'll give you an extra page on, on uh, ser. I think I'm going to give you an extra page on plurals too, so you can practice that idea of making things plural. How do we make nouns, people, places, things into a plural form? Bien? Okay. Okay, vale. If you have questions during the week, let me know. I would say definitely for this coming week, make sure you read through chapter five, capitulo cinco, chapter five. Um, I'll show you where they, uh, five and six, e seis and six. They're going to talk about jobs and family, vocabulary for jobs, vocabulary for family. Okay. And we're going to use some more picture prompts to show you examples of that in this coming week. And we'll, we'll weave that in with ser, we'll weave it in with I, we'll weave it in even a little bit with estar. Bien? Bien? Okay. Magnifico. Uh, bueno, entonces, nos vemos. We'll see you guys. Any uh, questions midweek, type me a quick email, shoot it my way. I'll get back to you uh, probably within about uh, 24 or 48 hours at worst. Bien, okay? Vale, magnífico. Hasta luego, hasta luego. Sí, nos vemos. Nos vemos.